The Lord be with you. Hey, you got it. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm uh, Doug Norris. I was interim pastor here for eight months in 2001. I was retired then, so you can figure out my age if you're good at mathematics. So welcome, church. Welcome. If you are visiting online or in person, we hope you feel at home. For those of you visitors who are in person, please visit the booth outside for a special welcome gift basket. Well, we come this morning to worship. And the word worship means to give worth, W-O-R-T-H, worth to God, to praise, to get beyond ourselves and give God glory and honor. And how do we do that? First, by singing. We praise God by singing, not this little nye, 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 nye stuff. You know, open your mouth and sing for me your gut. Oh, ho, ho. You know, let God hear you because it says make a joyful noise to the Lord. <laughs> and uh, the choir worships by singing. They are not here to entertain us. They are singing to God. They are singing praises to God on our behalf and we are welcome to participate by listening with our hearts. So we worship by singing, we worship by praying, by listening to God's word, and in gratitude, giving back to God a tithe of what God has given us. Let us pray. Yes, Lord, we are grateful, overwhelmed with blessings. Thank you, God. Help us focus on Jesus, leave our cares and worries at the cross, and open our hearts to receive what you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. The prelude helps us to prepare to center.
Please stand uh, for our call to worship and opening hymn as you are able. Words are on the screen. The King of Kings is raised in glory. Christ sits on the throne at the right hand of God. Come, let us worship and bow down to the Lord our Creator. Let us offer praise to Christ our Redeemer. Our Psalter is Psalm 93. The Lord is king, he is robed in majesty. Indeed, the Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. The world stands firm and cannot be shaken. Your throne, O Lord, has stood from time immemorial. You yourself are from the everlasting Christ. The floods have risen up, O Lord. The floods have roared like thunder, and the floods have lifted their pounding waves. But mightier than the wild raging of the seas, mightier than the breakers on the shore, the Lord of God is mightier than these. Your royal laws cannot be changed. Your reign, our Lord, is holy forever and ever. If the kids can join me up front here. All right, let's make sure we get some room here. All right, so. What's happening this Thursday? Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. So I have a Thanksgiving food in this bag. Does anybody want to take a guess? Elliot. Pie. Mm, what? Pie. Not pie. That would be great, though, huh? Charlie. <laughs> they are packing meals today. No, there's not enough room for a turkey in here. Liberty, do you have a guess? You forgot? That's okay. All right. Ready? It's, you want to say it, Elliot? It's a potato. Isn't this everyone's favorite Thanksgiving side dish? I like mashed potatoes. You like mashed potatoes? Mac and cheese. All right. So next time I'll bring pie and mac and cheese. Okay. So the interesting thing 
What's a potato feel like before we cook it? It's hard it's and dirty inside. It's hard and dirty, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not very good raw. You wouldn't want to eat it raw, right? It's pretty tough. So I know I have Millie here, and we have a challenge for Millie. And Blakely, do you want to do the challenge too? Sure, why not? Sure? Okay. So the challenge is I want you to try to get the straw through the potato. Go ahead. Can you force it? Is it working? Like all, the way all the way through. Oh, we broke a straw. It's so juicy. <laughs> it's juicy. Yeah, it's pretty hard. So if this straw represents tough things in life, and the straw represents us, if we try to do it all by ourselves, even if we use a ton of muscle, can we do it by ourselves? You think you could? <laughs> Elliot, we'll try in Sunday school, okay? But, and hopefully this works for Miss Kristen. Do you mind holding the mic for me, Kylie? So, if I cover it up with my thumb, and that acts as people that can help us, what do you think? Should I try it? Yeah. Oh, I did it, see? I got it all the way through. It's hard to get out now, but do you all right. see? So we got it through, and we were able to cover it up and help have people that helped us do it. We got that straw through the potato. Do you want to try a new straw, Blakely? Yes. There's potato juice all over. You want to try one? Okay, Everett. <laughs> Here you go. Can you pass that to Everett? So who are the people in our lives that help us with things? Shout them out. Ellie. Parents, Charlie, friends, who else helps us? God, what if we're sick? Who helps us when we're sick? Elliot. Yeah, our own bodies can help us, right? They know what to do a lot of the times. And what about what other people help us when we're sick? Doctors, nurses, right? So those are all special people that God has helped put us in our lives so that we never have to do things alone and that we still know that God is our ultimate helper by helping to put those people in our lives. So this year for Thanksgiving, that's something that I want us to remember that even when things are hard, we can't always do them by ourselves, and that we're thankful that there are people in our lives put there by God to help us. So let's pray together, friends. You can repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for always being there, for putting people in our lives to help, for giving us challenges to make us strong and never having us be alone. Amen. All right, let's head out to Sunday school. You can put your potatoes in here. <laughs>
if, uh, if you are perfect and have made no mistakes and are completely faithful and loyal to God, this prayer is not for you. <laughs> but for the rest of us, join me in the prayer of confession. God of all creation, we admit to our human limits as we try to imagine the reign of truth that you envision for us. When we follow worldly powers and stray from the good path, bring us back to you. And give us, Jesus, O oh God, a Jesus high and lifted up, but also chained and arraigned by authorities with boldness to tell the truth. Speak through our weeds and deeds that your will may be done in our time. Embolden us with the confidence that your reign will one day come. Hear this promise from the book of 1 John. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us pray. <clears throat> Holy God, we do not know how to pray, but Jesus invites us into the life that he shares with you. And so we keep coming because we want to live. Receive us now in our frailty, our complacency, and our desire. We pray for your church all over the world. May the life we discover in you bind us to each other and to the world you love. For no need is beyond the strength of your call, and no child of yours is expendable. Merciful God, give us wisdom and courage beyond our imagining. We pray for each leader who might be an instrument of peace in a troubled, troubled land. By the movement of your reconciling spirit, bless your people with the courage to reach past old wounds and persistent fears. God of resurrection, bring life where hope has died. We pray for friends and strangers in the grip of addiction. Make us able companions for one, each other and bring us with the hope that bears fruit. We pray for unsettled economies and those whose needs are overlooked in the choices of the powerful. May we, who know so much privilege, bear our responsibilities with open eyes and open hands. We pray for all who stand at the thresholds of life this morning, your children who are soon to be born, and your children who are soon to go home. We give thanks for new faces to love, ideas to ponder, work to do, and we marvel at the sturdy friendships and persistent memories that sustain us when the way is hard. May each be a reminder of your love and provision. And we thank you for the gift of song, for notes that speak when words fail, and choirs that practice at the end of long days. Give strength to leaders who call forth the best from us and invite us to breath together. Holy One, keep calling us into the world, your world, as salt and light. Equip us for the challenges we will face until we learn to worship in the most unlikely places, for you are the source of our song and the well from which we pray wherever we are planted. And we pray all of this by praying the prayer that you taught your disciples to say, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let's worship God with our tithes and offerings. If you're worshiping online, you may follow the prompts. Let me ask you, is your offering worthy of you? Worthy of God? Ushers.
When Doug suggested that the prayer of confession wasn't for you, if you were perfect, reminded me of a comment Billy Graham made I, can, I have to tell you about and add to it. On the 90th birthday, they were doing a series of his speeches and comments from ministers who had been influenced by his life. And they showed him talking to his crowd, inviting everybody down in the baseball stadium and come forth and gather some literature at the front. We're not asking you to join a church, but I know you're all looking for a church. And I just want you to know when you go back and you find that perfect church, it won't be perfect anymore. <laughs> so let's quiet our hearts and our minds as I invite you to listen to the word of God from the Gospel of John from the New Living Translation. Then Pilate went back into his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. Are you the king of the Jews, he asked him. Jesus replied, is this your own question, or did others tell you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate retorted. Your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. Pilate said, so you are a king? Jesus responded, 
You say I'm a king? Actually, I was born and came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. Well, good morning. My name is Chris, and I'm one of the pastors here at PVUMC, and we're so grateful to have you all in worship with us today, especially because it's just four days away from Thanksgiving. So those of you with 30-pound birds, this is your defrost uh, reminder. Get those going right now, otherwise you're going to have a bad time in, in four days. Uh, it, it, this time of year always reminds me of, of uh, getting together with my family and, uh, and, watching, uh, and watching sports, and, and you know, I had a cousin who was um, really into the Minnesota Vikings, and uh, every year uh, he would uh, wear, or every season, he would wear the same jersey, and uh, he wouldn't ever, ever wash it, because he was convinced that to wash the jersey was a huge, huge mistake that was going to lead to the collapse of the Minnesota Vikings. And I thought it was the grossest thing. I, this jersey was skin tight because the guy had gained a few pounds and there was barbecue sauce and like gravy all over it. And, and it, was, it was just the most disgusting thing. And I, I tried to say something one time and then I realized years, and then my mom shushed me and years later I would realize sometimes people have rituals that they do, things that they do that are important to them. And it's not my problem. And maybe I shouldn't worry about it so much, because life has its own issues. That was just a comment on nothing. So, let's pray as we prepare our hearts for the sermon. God, may the meditation of our hearts and the focus of our minds and the willingness of our souls be pleasing in your sight. And may only your words be heard. And may only your words be spoken. Amen. There's potato juice all over this stage. Audio transcript. Conversation between prisoner 8408360 and visitor. Central Detention Facility, 1901, D Street, Southeast, Washington, D.C., 2003, November 17th, 2021, at 9.33 a.m. Begin recording. Prisoner. Jim, thanks for coming out all this way, visitor. Uh, of course, Reverend. I, uh, uh, how do you turn the volume up on this thing, prisoner? I don't think you can. It's, it's pretty basic. Just talk loud into the mouthpiece, visitor. Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, good, good morning, Reverend. Um, it's good to see you, prisoner. Good to see you too, John, Jim. Thanks for coming up all the way to Washington. I, I really appreciate it, visitor. Yeah, sort of weird seeing you here behind this glass, prisoner. Yeah, I'm told that it's for our protection so people can't slip other contraband and the like, and visitor. That makes sense, that makes sense. Prisoner. And how are the people back in Mapleville? How's Second United Methodist Church? Visitor. Oh, we're great. Thanks for asking. And doing real well. We were all a little surprised to learn that you'd been a, uh, well, uh, prisoner. Incarcerated? Visitor. Yeah, well, it's not every day your pastor gets locked up in jail, is it? Prisoner. No, I suppose not. Visitor. What the heck happened anyway, pastor? You're all, anyone can talk about back home. Prisoner. Well, I'm glad you asked, Jim. First, it isn't what you think. 
I imagine there must be an awful lot of gossip back in Mapleville, but I want to assure you that I have not gotten wrapped up in any of the mess that the media is accusing me of. Visitor. Well, what, what did happen then, if you don't mind me asking? Prisoner. Jim, I, I had a vision. A vision from the Lord. Visitor. A vision? Prisoner. Yes, a vision for how we, as faithful Christians, could retake this country back for Jesus. Visitor. You're going to have to explain this one to me, Pastor. Prisoner. Okay, I will start from the beginning. It was... I guess January 1st, 2021, and I was sitting in my office at the church praying for the fate of our country. It's no secret, Jim, that I have long thought that our nation has been in steep moral decline for a long, long time. Every day there seemed to be more heartache and more division and more separation between us and God. And as we approached a new year, my heart was heavy with the prospect of the future. And so I locked myself away in my tiny office and I was pleading with God to make me an instrument for his service, to give me a sign. And that's when I had a vision directly from the Lord. Jesus himself came down from the heavens and touched my heart. He told me not to worry, that he, Jesus Christ, was king over all, that his power would be known by all. And then, For a moment, I briefly looked over to my laptop, and there it was, clear as day, a picture of the U.S. Capitol building in Washington, D.C. on some news website, and I knew right then and there what Jesus was calling me to do. It was my job to bring Jesus to our leaders in our nation's capital. Like the prophets of old, I would proclaim the word of the Lord to the corrupt politicians of our land, ushering in a new era of revival and faith in our nation's capital. So that night, I took a few thousand dollars from the church's mission fund, visitor. You did what? Prisoner. And I bought a first-class plane ticket to Washington, D.C. And starting that very next day, January 2nd, I took my Bible out to the sidewalk just in front of the U.S. Capitol building, right there on 1st Street Northwest, and I read the word of the Lord to anyone who would listen. I prayed and I pleaded for Jesus to come back, to be king, to right the wrongs that our country has made. And for four days straight, I stood outside, through the snow, in the cold, in the sleet, and I proclaimed, Jim, I proclaimed that the day of the Lord had come and that it was time for Jesus to take his rightful place on his throne, ruling the nations from his seat of power, as foretold in Luke chapter 1, verse 33, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his reign shall be without end. And then on January 6th, when I arrived at the Capitol, a great multitude surrounded me, And at first, I thought that they were others like me who had received a vision from the Lord, but I would later learn that they were just there for some political event of some kind. (laughs) Now, Jim, you know me. I have never wanted to be too political, and so I haven't been keeping up with any of that. But when hundreds of people began to spill over the fences and the guardrails and make their way into the Capitol building, I knew that that was my chance. God had sent these people to make a way for me into the places that I would be unable to go in alone. So I went with them, secretly, incognito, ignoring their chants and their battle cries, and I was swept up in the crowd. I I never forgot, though. I was not on their mission. I was on God's mission. And eventually... I followed a man through a great set of doors and up some stairs, my heart surging, adrenaline coursing through my veins, and I suddenly found myself standing all alone at the podium of the Speaker of the House. Visitor. Wow, that's that's incredible. Prisoner. And Jim, I just knew 
That was what I was in Washington, D.C. for. That was the moment that I had been praying for. I knew that it was my holy job to invite Jesus down to take his rightful seat as the new speaker of the house of the most powerful country in the world so that he could enact new laws that would make us a Christian nation once again. So I threw open my Bible and I looked to the heavens and I cried out, come, O Lord Jesus, and ascend to this position of power. Take your rightful seat as the ruler of our country. Bring righteousness back to these halls of power. Restore your justice to the laws of this nation and bring us all back to you, almighty and sovereign God. Come and claim your kingship over this country once again. Visitor. And then what happened? Prisoner. Well, nothing. I stood there for a few moments before a Capitol Police officer tackled me and cuffed me and brought me here to be processed, and now I'm detained for a trial. 41 second pause. Visitor. Pastor, can I ask you a question? Prisoner. Of course. Visitor, I don't mean to offend you or nothing, but uh, are you sure that Jesus even wanted to be king? Prisoner, what? Visitor, I, uh, I don't mean nothing by it, of course, and, and I realize that I don't have one of those seminary educations like you do, but it... It just occurs to me that, that Jesus maybe didn't want to be the king or the speaker of the house or whatever it is that you were hoping for. Prisoner. What in the world are you talking about, Jim? Of course Jesus wants to be king. He's the rightful heir to the throne of David, the ruler over the nation of Israel, and of his reign there shall be no end, as found in Luke chapter... Visitor. Yeah, no, I, I heard you the first time, Pastor. I get what you're trying to say. It's just... It's just since you've been away and all, on account of your uh, incarceration, all of us at Second United Methodist Church have had to try and fill in the gap that you left our Sunday morning worship service with. For the past few months, we've all had to do the stuff that you used to do. Patty is the one who unlocks the door and turns on the lights, and Raul, he starts the coffee makers and sets out the cups and stuff, and Darlene, she picks out the hymnals on Tuesday morning and prints out the bulletin for us, and actually it's all working pretty well. Prisoner. Yes, and visitor. Yeah, well, and the guys from the Thursday morning Bible study are all taking turns offering up the sermon each week on account of the fact that most of us are retired and we got the time. They aren't, just, they aren't anything fancy, just 10 minutes of us sharing our thoughts and the reading for the week, but I like to think that we're getting the job done. Prisoner. Yes, okay, and visitor. So anyway, Back when you decided to take this, uh, I don't know, vacation or whatever as you call it, we decided to start with the book of John because you always told us that, that was the first book of the Bible a Christian should read. Prisoner. Well, that is a good place to start, but visitor. Yeah, well, I got to say, Pastor, the more that I read the book of John, the less I am personally convinced that Jesus is like you sometimes make him out to be. I mean, this week, we've gotten to John chapter 18, and it's, a, it's what they call Christ the King Sunday, according to the calendar hanging up in your office. And, and it's the part of the story where Jesus is on trial before a, a Pilate. And, and even when Pilate is questioning Jesus, asking him point blank if he really is the king of the Jews, Jesus doesn't even give him a straight answer. He just says, that's what you say. Now, You'd think that if he really was the king, if he really had all this power and he wanted all this control, that he'd be, I don't know, more upfront about it. But he isn't. He's like dodgy and evasive. At best, he's, uh, what, do you, what do you call it, uh, amb ambivalent about the whole thing. Or like just a few chapter er, uh, chapters earlier in John chapter 6, right when Jesus feeds that huge crowd of people with a few loaves and, and a couple of fish, the Bible says that the people gathered 
saw his miraculous powers and wanted to make him king of the Jews right then and there. But what does Jesus do? He knows what the crowds want to do, and he slips right out of the whole thing to a mountain by himself because he didn't want them to force him to be king. I mean, pastor, no offense, but it just doesn't seem like Jesus wanted to be king or the Caesar, or the emperor, or the speaker of the house, or president, or whatever. Heck, I don't even think that Jesus would want to be on the town council back in Mapleville. (laughs) Because it just seems like Jesus' ways are not our ways, are they? All the ways that humans use power and control and authority and titles to keep us all in line. It just doesn't seem like the Jesus I read about would have been interested in any of that. Because I think of all the qualities of a king, right, of, of someone who's in charge, someone who actively seeks out power that, that they don't already have, someone who makes compromises and bends over backwards for other influential people that can help them out, and I guess that doesn't really sound like Jesus at all. I mean, Pilate, at one point, pastor, he, he straight up asks him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus doesn't say yes or no, but he answers with a question of his own, and finally, After a lot of poking and prodding, Jesus says, my kingdom is not of this world. And I remember you always said that when Jesus tells Pilate that his kingdom is not of this world, that he's saying that he's the king of heaven, like it's some faraway place. But but what if that's not what he meant at all? Maybe Jesus was saying that his kingdom was so unlike the nation of Rome with its kings and rulers that oppress the poor to protect the powerful, that that you really can't even compare the two. Maybe Jesus was saying that he was from a place that was so different that whatever we think, when we think of a king here, means something completely new in the kingdom of God. It's like if Jesus really wanted to be king in the way we think kings should be, of course his followers would be fighting back and they'd be using swords and spears to keep him safe because the only power that that sort of power understands is violence or the threat of violence because that's the way kings work. But Jesus, he preaches things like peace and forgiveness. And he tells us that the ones who are blessed in his kingdom are the meek and the merciful and the powerless. Do you recall, Pastor, a few, a few years ago when, when you were preaching on the book of Judges in the Old Testament and everyone thought it was the most boring thing in the world? No offense. But I just remember one thing you said was that even way back then, even way before Jesus was around, way before Jesus was born, the Israelites were in the wilderness, and they were supposed to be a different kind of people. They were supposed to follow in the ways of the Lord, not of man. But they weren't satisfied with that. They said they wanted to be like everyone else. They wanted a king like all the other nations around them. But God tells them, that isn't going to work out like you want it to. When you put your hope in humans and human ways to solve all your problems, it's going to fail. The only way to find true life is to follow in the ways of God, which are not like yours. But those Israelites, they insisted, so God relented. He gave them judges and then kings, and none of those kings were the saviors the people wanted them to be. It's like that's how it is today. Seems like we place all of our hope in every new political leader or movement that promises us that they're the next best thing. But then they disappoint us. They fail us. They put their own interests and the interests of their conspirators before the good of the people. They're never the saviors that we hope that they are. But then it just seems, Pastor, that then comes Jesus. And at least, again, at least in the book of John, Jesus isn't interested in being the king. Not like we expect him to, at least. See, it isn't that Jesus isn't a king. It's just that he isn't a king. Like we think a king should be. Our kings are served by others. Jesus came to serve. Our kings seek out power by campaigning and boasting and making promises. Jesus came humbly, 
never seeking to be made king. It's like a whole different way to see our power dynamics and our relationships. But I guess, isn't that sort of the point of the gospel? To show us new ways to live? To help us see this world in new, life-giving ways? What if we all stopped trying to convince ourselves that the answer to all of our problems was from the top down, but instead imagined a kingdom that was ruled from the bottom up? What if the way to the kingdom of God isn't through some big campaign speech, but through simple acts of service? What if we stopped heaping all of the blame on our elected officials and started taking responsibility for making this earth as it is in heaven ourselves? Prisoner. Jim, I appreciate your attempts to interpret the Bible. I really do, but they're ultimately misguided, very simplistic, very unrealistic. But you needn't worry. My lawyers tell me that I'm going to get out of this place any day now. And when I do, I'm going to come back to Second United Methodist Church in Mapleville, and we are going to get back to basics. Visitor. Well, that's a relief, Pastor. Prisoner. Because I was wrong, Jim, completely off base. Jesus isn't going to take the throne in the political arenas of today because the reality is that it's the large tech companies that really control everything. It's the Facebooks and the Amazons that really run the world. That's why when I return home, I am going to begin to raise funds immediately to travel to California, to Silicon Valley, and preach the word of God to the godless corporate tech giants. Jesus is going to take down Jeff Bezos and Mark Zuckerberg and rise up and become the CEO of our hearts and nation. And that's why I'm asking you to go home, Jim, and begin raising funds on my behalf. Oh, Jim, Jim, what are you doing? Why are you hanging up the phone? Where are you going? Jim. Hey, Jim, come back. Jim, Jim. End audio transcript. Let us pray. God, the way of the cross is a way of foolishness to those who are suffering. the way of sacrifice, of servanthood, of humility, are all such foolishness. God, help us in this time and at this place to recognize that perhaps what will truly save this world is the foolishness of love. Amen.
always a lot of stuff going on at our church, and I just want to let you know, we understand that this might be a difficult time of year for some of you, especially if this is the first season, holiday season, in which you um, are journeying, th- that you are journeying through without a loved one. And uh, if that is you, or if you acutely feel the loss of somebody um, who has gone uh, home to Jesus uh, at any time in your life, we would encourage you to come to our memorial service of light tonight at 6 p.m. in the chapel. It's a wonderful time of remembrance and honoring those who have gone before us, and an opportunity for you to uh, enter into this holiday season um, in the right spirit. And uh, we encourage you to bring a candle with you that you can then bring home and light um, in a, uh, whenever, whenever you feel is appropriate. And that's at 6 p.m. here in the chapel. Next, we have a couple Christmas things happening. December 11 is our Christmas Wonderland. Um, it's going to be uh, for families. They they have an insane amount of stuff coming, like bouncy houses and snow cones and a bunch of stuff. Um, the, uh, and, and this is a great event for you to connect with your family um, and, and if you're a grandparent to bring your grandkids to um, and a good time of fellowship and to connect with other people. Finally, our uh, annual Christmas concert that our music staff puts on, that's uh, such a great experience and, and one of the, really, the traditions for me and my family as we go into the Christmas holiday is going to be December 12th at 6 p.m. Yep, I didn't bring my sheet with me, so I'm guessing. Um, And it's going to be right here in the sanctuary. I encourage you to bring your friends and family to that. And also, come and get some donuts and coffee after worship in the Fellowship Center. And now, hear and receive this benediction from the Lord. You are the beautiful people of God. And God loves you with an absolutely perfect love. Go now into a world that desperately needs to be loved and love as Christ loves you. And the peace of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ will be yours now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.